Okay, so are you, can I start? Please, yeah. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Christopher Ray. Chris is an associate professor at Stanford University and his work is to understand how software and hardware systems will change as a result of machine learning. Research from his group has been incorporated into scientific and humanitarian efforts, such as the fight against human trafficking, along with products from technology and enterprise companies. He co-founded many famous AI projects, including Samba Nova, Snorkel, and Factory, along with two companies that are, have been acquired and are now part of Apple. He also received many awards, including a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 2015. And we are very excited to have him as a keynote speaker today. And he will tell us about his favorite AI trends that he unironically loves. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. So one of the reasons I, I have to say that unironically loves is there's a sense in which these trends are a little bit ridiculous. If you've been in computer science for a while, you remember when AI was a dirty word and you know even machine learning was a dirty word. And some of these trends, maybe I've been in Silicon Valley too long, but I, I genuinely love. So I'm really excited to share these with you. Thank you so much for, for having today. And, and please don't think I take it too seriously. Uh, you know, Definitely give me crazy feedback. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just excited. So the three trends have become kind of crazy buzzwords that I'm interested in. Um, Data-centric AI, which as we'll talk about, our work was kind of at the outset of and, and why I'm really excited about that. I'll talk a very little bit about this trend called de declarative machine learning, which we've been really excited about uh, over the last couple of years. And I'll, I'll say, say where we are there. And then foundation models, which are these large scale models that we'll talk about that have some pretty surprising kind of capabilities. Now, to tell you why I love these things, you have to understand I'm kind of a myopic engineering focused human being. I like to build things. And so I have to tell you like what I was building and what I continue to build and why I like these trends. And these trends, the reason I love them so much isn't necessarily because of the grand AGI vision. Like that's cool. I'm excited people are excited about that. But it's because it helps me build real systems that in some ways I've been struggling to build for, for more than a decade. So in 2016, we were kind of sitting around and we were watching this huge amount of money and talent pour into making models bigger, faster, and higher quality. And we realized that because of the open culture of AI, we started to think, you know, everything was going to be open. People were going to have commodity models everywhere. The models were going to kind of be something you could very easily download. And that kind of came true, honestly. Um, but we were starting to think at that time, well, what would be important for success or failure in building these systems? And we got really excited because it started to feel like it was moving less from, you know, how do you do kind of backprop more efficiently at large scales or which layer norms do you use and which places to, hey, how is this going to change computing systems? And so two of those trends that popped up for us were uh, first data centric AI. We started to notice that in a bunch of situations, data was the reason you had success or failure. It wasn't necessarily the model, but the data was encoding your problem in some sense. And so we needed to study it in a first class way. And I'll share some of our work there uh, on a system called Snorkel, which we're really, you know, been really excited about over the last couple of years. The second uh, tranche of, of work was around thinking about what we call declarative machine learning. And the idea was right, you know, in kind of 2016, 2017, you were hiring people because they could read the papers and innovate and, and write models. We started to realize there was going to be a huge class of people who are using these systems who just wanted to get their job done, where their job was something like build a service, and they wanted it to be easy to maintain over time. And in the same way that like data processing systems in the 60s and 70s, like you had people who were great programmers who could eke out all of the different bits of performance, that kind of gave way for some applications to things like SQL, where you have a high level interface and you don't really care how the answer is computed per se, you wanna go and build your you know, application on top. And so we were really excited about what would that trend mean for AI and machine learning. And both of these were still kind of in the early phases. The third piece of this are these things called foundation models. And I kind of lost my mind. I'll share why I lost my mind and some of these applications uh, working on them. And we started this Center for Foundation Models Research, uh, the CRFM at Stanford, uh, Percy Liang leads it. And these models are kind of amazing in some senses. You take a huge amount of data and a huge amount of compute in these huge models, and then kind of interesting things happen. And these models, which are trained, as we'll talk about, just to predict the next word, all of a sudden have behaviors that are somehow useful in other contexts. 
Um, and I'll share with you kind of how I came to love these models over time. But one of their key features is this idea that you can handle many different tasks uh, by just describing the task to the system in natural language and not having to run, you know, any kind of backprop or training algorithm on top of them. And I think this really changes the interface for how they're used. This one we're still really at the beginnings of. I mean, these models are being produced and we're, we're making a bet here um, that, you know, there's a bunch of interesting stuff that's gone on now, but there's a huge amount of investment in these from all the big tech companies. And so the question is, what will they look like in a couple years? And so we're, we're at the beginning of this wave um, and, and wave of investment. Now, as I said, I'm a myopic kind of thinker. Um, I like to build certain things. And the I'll share with you the apps that, you know, we can now have an undergrad build in hours that literally took my team of PhDs years to build. And the thing that's built by the undergrad now in a, in a week or so, um, you know, it's actually better. Her system's better than ours in a lot of ways. And so that was, that was shocking to me. And it's something you can only do with these new kind of technologies. So I'll share those with you for what it's worth. Now, you know, when people talk about foundation models, I understand why people get excited. They start getting excited about things like AGI. Um, you know, my lab has people who drink soy lint, but, but I don't, I eat regular food. So I don't get as excited about that stuff. I think it's interesting. I'm glad that the field has a vision and a spirit to it, but there's a lot of practical reasons to love these crazy models. Um, the first one is what I kind of called sealed engines. And I'll share a little bit more with you about this. So the idea is when you build these industrial pipelines and I'll, and I'll share my history in a minute, but when you build these industrial pipelines, there's lots of tiny details that you have to get right when to, to ship the final service. But most of those little tiny details are actually irrelevant. And one of the things that I was you know, fortunate to participate in was that we took one of those systems that had all those tiny handwritten details and we just trained it end to end in a self-supervised way. And, and I'll share with you the, the actual system. And it dramatically lowered the number of people that were required to maintain that product. And so if you see the old style way of building machine learning systems, you'd have 20 people who were analyzing data and changing little pieces, and they're kind of playing whack-a-mole with all their problems. It was, a, it was a really hard thing. So these foundation models and these larger trained models seem to kind of seal the engine and, and prevent people from poking at them in ways that are not always helpful. The second thing, which is actually to me at this moment more interesting, just you know, maybe this morning, is this what I call death by a thousand cuts problems. So in some problems that I worked on for a long time, there are these type of questions in computer science where no individual instance of the problem seems very hard, but the sheer variety of reasoning you need makes it difficult to like write down a Python program or some optimization method to solve it. The canonical one for me are things like data cleaning or entity matching. And I'll show you some examples. Any looking at any two records, a human has almost no problem saying, oh, record A and record B, you know, from different data sets are actually talking about the same real world person. But it's fairly difficult to write down all the subtle clues that you use. And somehow these foundation models, because they're trained in this really unstructured, wild way, give us a new attack on these problems, which frankly, some of which I, I didn't think we would ever be able to, to solve or you know, in the next 10 or 15 years. And, and, and I'll share some of those recent progress with you with a preprint we're just about to post. So the rest of the talk is structured kind of like this. I'm gonna tell you about my history because that will hopefully illuminate my biases because I'm saying some things that you know, sound crazy about the, all these weird trends. So you should at least understand like, why I think this stuff um, so you can discount it appropriately. I'll then have a kind of an optimistic section of the talk, which will be the bulk, which I'll talk about this data centric AI work, kind of review what we've been up to there, try and express to you why I think about it as a programming kind of first approach. Talk a little bit about foundation models and show you some of the results that really blew my mind. And then finally, I'm gonna talk if I have time about kind of new abstractions and new problems. So of course, when you raise the level of abstraction, these problems creep in um, that you didn't anticipate. Uh, and I wanna share some of those with you because they're, they're really much on my mind of, of what we do in research, okay? So first, my professional history is very strange and I don't expect that you should care or know about it, but I do want you to understand kind of the biases that I have because they may be significant. They, you may look at that and say, oh my gosh, if I were exposed to those things, I may agree with that, but that's crazy. I think this, is, this other thing's gonna win out. So let me just tell you a little bit about my history. So in antiquity, and so 2014, 2015, we started to build these systems that were taking large amounts of unstructured information, text, web pages, tables, and creating knowledge bases out of them. That's what we were really excited about. And there's these three characters, Fung, Mike, and, 
and so we're we're helping you know build these things and it was really exciting we applied it to things like fighting human trafficking which was really a, an absolute privilege with a huge cadre of people uh, we showed that we could get higher accuracy on very very narrow tasks here than human volunteers uh, which was really exciting and then we also realized we just needed to scale these models up which which won a test of time award uh, which we we're excited about so the thing that I actually learned during this time period or that stuck with me was that these systems were incredibly hard to operate and we needed to radically de-skill them. And most of the people who got excited about them actually weren't in computer science. When I would go give talks about these systems, it was the folks who were you know, chemical engineers or biologists who would tell me, take my student please and let them create this data because it will change the research that I can do. And so that really stuck with me in a powerful way. We need to de-skill these systems. And so, Deep Dive and, and all the rest and its company Lattice that came after it was trying to uh, de-skill these things and, and make them more accessible to people. We were a little bit too early, but that was okay. So we were too early, so Apple bought us, which was nice, a nice outcome. Uh, Apple was a, was a customer actually. And so most of the team kept building that product and we got eventually sent to the spaceship. That's the picture of it in the background. Now, Fung and I forked off either because we were unruly or they thought we might do something useful, more likely that we were just being unruly. And we built a bunch of production use cases around extraction, search, and integration. I won't bore you with the details. The thing that I am excited about is we did ship a lot of code and our work was used by a ton of people, which you know was great because Apple has this huge install base. And that was a first for me. Like I had been you know, mainly an academic uh, through and through at that point. And so being able to actually ship these things was, was really one of the experiences I wanted when we sold the company. Now we locked in on two problems there, uh, which are relevant, I think, to folks here um, and have been driving a lot of my research. The first is we thought about how do we make developers kind of more productive with machine learning? And I started to realize there was this kind of problem of new modelitis that people had. They would try some new model that they downloaded, but that actually wasn't improving the product. Looking at the data, analyzing what was going on, that was really valuable, but this system kind of forced them to like write new code for a new transformer every time they, they had a new idea. It's a little bit strange. The second thing which stuck with me is these complex tail-driven applications like entity linking were really, really challenging. And somehow industries like not totally set up to solve them because they're so hard. And, and AI and machine learning tools, because we focus so much on benchmarks, kind of ignored them. And so I'll come back to that in the second part of the talk. Now we, we wrote a system a description finally in 2019 to let us talk about what we were doing. And it was this kind of zero code for deep learning system. Um, that phrase actually came from somebody else, uh, Piero. Uh, Piero, I was fortunate enough to meet. I actually just started talking on a panel once about how much I loved his system. I didn't know him at all. And then some friends put us in uh, touch. He was at Uber at the time. And it was super similar to Overton, which was the system that, that I was writing um, on my IKEA couch, as I mentioned. And you know, but it was really better in many important ways. Like he was, he's a real artist and I learned a lot from those conversations. It was funny how many small details were similar and then how many kind of big things I got wrong. But I started talking to uh, Piero and he actually just recently co-founded a company um, called Predibase. Um, and we wrote a couple of papers about why we thought declarative machine learning was, was kind of the future of these things. These have been used, um, which is exciting. They inspired work not only at Apple and our system and at Uber, uh, but also Meta's Looper system, uh, which runs a lot of their AI products you know, very generously cites these papers and, and adds a whole ton of stuff about how they do reinforcement learning across their products, things that were much more advanced than we were considering in 2017, 2018, when we were building our systems. So I stayed at Apple for three years. And while I was there, I co-founded three companies, which were mentioned. I just want to say unequivocally, like Apple is 10 out of 10, great experience, love it. If they make you an offer, you should take it. It's great. I had a blast there. They also bought Inductive while I was there, which we co-founded. And I'll tell you a little about what Inductive does later. Uh, I realized though that I'm really best early. And so as mentioned, I co-founded this incubator and investment firm. The reason I bring that up is because I invest in a lot of these technologies. So you should be, you know, use a level of appropriate level of skepticism. Like I, I think I'm a true believer, but maybe I'm just a shell. I don't know. Uh, but take a look because, you know, I've been looking at these things and um, putting my money where my mouth is, I guess is the, the way to say it in a positive way. All right. So let me start those two blocks that I wanted to share with you. The first is this kind of myopic view of data-centric AI. How did we get started in this problem? And of course, this little octopus, uh, this snorkel octopus is the thing that really got me started. 
So we started thinking, as I mentioned, you know, what was going on in ML applications? And there are really three ingredients to a traditional supervised application. You have a model, you have some data, and you have some hardware. And the point is, is that models, as we talked about, you could download, you know, the state of the art models. Hugging face makes this easy for NLP, but almost all the models are really public these days. The hardware, you know, because of the cloud, lots of people have access to hardware. There's great innovations going on in hardware, but people can get access to it. You can pay some dollars and, and get access to it. The problem was the training data. So the training data in some ways was the way that you were encoding your application. It was how you described to the machine learning model what you wanted to do. And so in some ways it couldn't kind of commoditize like the other two because it's just like, you know, every application you want to build it. It has some unique quirks of what, what you wanted to do. But there was really no way of thinking about how you program training data, right? It was just always this blob, this afterthought. And so we started talking about how would you program training data and what would that look like if we brought programming principles to it? Now, this seems like heresy to a machine learning person. Like when I teach 229, which I'll teach this afternoon, the first lecture says there are X and Y pairs. X are our data objects, Y are our labels. And where do those come from? Where does that supervision come from? Well, it comes from God herself. So the idea that like you're going to model this process seems kind of foreign and strange to people. Like it's the starting point. It's like not machine learning. It happened too early. But, you know, if you've ever built one of these systems, the problem is, is that training data is doesn't come from God herself. It comes from, you know, a dirty, messy, horrible process. And like you have all these different streams of data that kind of come together and have different qualities and are correlated in weird ways. And it's kind of an awful process. And so, you know, it's not uncommon that in these applications, people are spending, you know, the vast majority of their time kind of cleaning and integrating the data. And then they don't have any tools to do it. So we wanted to make this a little less awful. That was our goal. We wanted to think about kind of how could we provide mathematical and system structure that would just make this less awful. We're not gonna solve it in any kind of true sense, but we're gonna try and, as I said, just make it less awful. And that's what we set out to do. Okay. So I'll go one step beyond that. Um, it turns out actually, in my view, supervision isn't you know only just this kind of afterthought, it's also where the action has been. And that modeling differences have become overrated because of that massive investment, not because they're not important. I still work on models, but there are just so many folks working on them. But these supervision differences are underrated. And when I used to say this, it was very, very early and almost no one was working on supervision. But now there's tons of papers on it. So this is this is not unique to us. It's not really a hot take anymore. Okay. There's this one thing that I like to do. Maybe it's because I'm self-conscious uh, about how I think about research. But I always want to hold my feet to the fire in the sense that I want to build real applications so that I understand like, you know, where the actual pain points are and, and make sure we're really making things you know, easier and higher quality than what we think. So we, we were building one of these such, such applications for radiology. And this was back in 2018, 2019, um, when we started this stuff. So the problem we were looking at was a simple one. It's called triage. So, you know, you take these images. But the problem is, is that some of them don't get read. And the reason they don't get read is because, you know, there's just not enough people on staff who can read them. Um, maybe there's something in them, the doctor decides they don't care. So the point I'm trying to make is the baseline here for machine learning is super easy. It's not looking at the data at all. We're not trying to say we're, you know, better than radiologists. We're just trying to say like, there's a bunch of data that no one's even looking at. Could we somehow surface things that, you know, maybe they wish they had known if they had taken the time. And we're not the only ones talking about this. This was something that that other people, you know, already described. Because there were various staff shortages, they were not reading some data that they thought could be quite important. So this is what we were looking at. So we asked question, you know, is deep learning the answer? And that turned out to not even be a relevant question. It's not even an easy question, but there was no benchmark data set at the time. The effects of data quality were unclear. There was no assessment of existing algorithms. We didn't know if they worked well or poorly or, or what was hard in this problem. And there was no feedback from the clinical community on the couple of pieces of work that had been out there. So Jared from that previous slide spent a year trying to answer it. And he spent almost 18 months collecting data and going around to clinicians. He created a huge data set of clin clinically relevant labels. He evaluated the effect of label quality and he published that work in a clinical journal. I'm very proud to say that a lot of the process that he developed, actually the radio radiology has adopted as kind of one of the standard ways that you should you know, have a best practice. Now, one thing that was fascinating was when we ran this study, the DenseNet here is the CVPR best paper in 2017. It's as fancy as it gets. Killian's model, it's just awesome. I really love it. The model at the top is the bag of visual features model with an SVM. The difference between them was only two or three points. 
Now I'll come back to the point that quality is really not why I love deep learning so much. So don't think that this is me saying like deep learning is not great. Deep learning is great. But the difference was slight and it made me really scared as I'll come back to at the end of the talk. So please remember this, this point. The point that I want to make is that it took almost a year to obtain high quality data, but it took about a week to run those models. And so, you know, there's a huge gap in how long these things take. So I won't belabor the point, even in benchmarks, you can see that these kind of data preparation techniques called like augmentations are absolutely critical. There are tens of points rather than tenths of points, you know, 10 rather than 0.1 um, for these models and supervision and people caught on to this. And two things we're very proud of here in the early days were that, you know, one of my former postdocs now professor at Wisconsin and Alex and, and Henry who are now both at Snorkel um, learned about how could you, you know, kind of learn these augmentations and, and do a better job. I won't believe the point. What I cared about, hopefully I've convinced you of, is that training data is interesting to think about. And what would it mean to have a model of training data creation? What would you want out of such a thing? So what are the problems that I don't like about training data? So first is that it's slow, it's expensive, and it's static. And static is the one that's most interesting to me intellectually, but slow and expensive are the ones that I think people in industry care about them. So what do I mean by this? So manual labels are slow. The first label and the last label take about the same amount of time. Humans don't get that much faster at labeling data. It also takes a huge amount of time to even tell people what to label. And YouTube, as we'll talk about, took seven months for them to write a specification for one of their tasks. It's expensive. We've worked on problems where, you know, you have someone getting paid $600 an hour to look at these images because there's some very rarefied expert and only one out of 100 contains the phenomenon that you want them to look at. Those are massively expensive problems. Um, and so humans are just really, really expensive. You'd love to be able to, to change that cost equation. And the thing that's most intellectually interesting to me is that labels are static. So maybe you started with positive and negative, and then you realized you used neutral. You wanted neutral. The old way is that you had to throw out all of your labels and start from scratch. And the thing that I realized whenever I was building these systems is we always got the specification wrong every single time because we didn't understand our data well enough. You run the model, you learn more about what you're, the phenomenon you're interested in, and you kind of want to make it, you know, refactor it slightly. You can do that in code. Somehow you can't do that with traditional labels, right? So we started looking at a framework we call programmatic labels. It's not the only way you could do this, but it's the one that we picked up. It's going to be fast. You write programs and then run them. So the developer, the person who's actually building the system, they're the ones who are actually, you know, writing these labels. They're not sending it out to some third party to go label. It's cheap because it runs at AWS speed rather than the, you know, fleets of, you know, radiologists or something, potentially in some cases. And it's dynamic because it's going to treat labeling as code, as we'll talk about. And that's going to allow you to refactor it, reuse it. And this turned out to be, to me, the most important thing. You have some labels for an old task. You can reuse them. You have an old model. How do you put them together? That's really exciting. Now, there's a trade-off. Nothing comes for free in this life, unfortunately. Programmatic labels are going to be noisy, lower quality. They're going to be potentially correlated, as we see in some ways. And if we don't handle those things, all these beautiful properties will kind of go away. So we want to ha handle these properties and because we're academics, we want to do it in the you know, most optimal way we can. We want to be actually just an optimal way, okay? information theoretically. All right, so we're going to model the process. That's our idea. So we'll talk a little bit about how, uh, our interface. We'll talk about this approach to learn quality and accuracy of sources. And then we'll talk about training an end model. So the way it works, by the way, so just to say this, like I, it's not something where we're coming up with the idea of using kind of lower quality supervision. People have been doing this forever since you know 90s, 2000s. Um, it's just been a thing that people do. Everyone in machine learning kind of knows their, their, their tricks. What we want to do is take all those tricks and put them on, on, in, on different footing, on the same footing so that they can, you can use all those different pieces together. And so they'll have different error profiles and different correlations with one another. And basically I just want an abstraction that lets me quickly kind of combine them. Okay. We're not inventing these new methods. We, we did invent a couple, but that doesn't matter. What matters is putting them together and using them no longer in isolated ways. And that was something people didn't do. You would have your trick. That was your paper. That was your system. We use pattern matching, distance supervision. That's it. Okay. So Snorkel is all about that. Trying to formalize this ad hoc supervision in a formal, unified, theoretically grounded approach. We want some theory in there so that we know this quality is what we hope. 
Um, and maybe because we like proving theorems. I don't know. But it, it, it's useful. Maybe. So the folks who did the real work, as always, are these characters uh, who are, you know, Box, a professor at, at Brown, Alex is at Washington, um, and the rest of these folks are at Snorkel, the company, which I'll briefly mention at the end. So let me just give you a toy example so you can kind of see how this might work. So we want to do something really, really simple. This is way, way toy kind of example for the platform, but hopefully gives you a sense. So Bob Jones is a specialist uh, and leading the cardiology division at St. Francis. And we want to label that Bob Jones is a person and St. Francis is a hospital. OK, so we, how would you create a weak supervision kind of system for this, this application? So the idea, let's look at zoom in on the St. Francis, is that we'll have these Python functions, which we call labeling functions, and they're just a wrapper around anything. So they could be a wrapper around um, this off the shelf classifier and that thing votes person. Right. So it says, oh, I know St. Francis. That looks like a person to me. Person's name. I vote person. When I talked about kind of refactoring the code, these things can call each other. So one of the wrappers could say uppercase existing classifier, takes the existing classifier and adds some extra conditions, but it still erroneously votes person on this example. And then we have the distance supervision rule. We have a list of hospital names. You know what? I've seen St. Francis as a hospital. I'm going to vote hospital. What I hope to get across here is that these sources are noisy. They conflict with one another, so we have to do some resolution across them, and they're correlated. Clearly, the first and the second, the second one actually calls the first rule. Now, we want to do this without any reference to ground truth, and the reason we want, don't want to use ground truth is we want it to, for a bunch of both art, kind of artistic reasons, aesthetically, I, I want to do it uh, because we can iterate much faster and get to these accuracies, but also pragmatically, um, that will help us iterate and, and, and build these systems more quickly. Okay? So there, there's, there's something going on here that's interesting. So the way it works is users are going to write these labeling functions. They're going to train, a, they're going to use what we call a label model, and then they're going to use those labels that they produce in a probabilistic end model. And that can be an arbitrary deep learning model. Okay. The key idea is that we have the key step that I'm going to tell you about here that I'm going to zoom in on. The rest of it's important, but this zoom in on this piece is the fact that we're going to take in those sources of information and we're going to give you a probability of how of kind of for every point, what is its distribution over labels? And we're going to try to infer that by looking at the quality of the sources. Remember that messy streams of sewer that we were looking at earlier? We just want to know how high quality each one of those sewer streams are and how they're correlated. We want to learn that without any training data. Okay. So how does this work? So if you remember your graphical models course, we're going to think about this as a graphical model. Every one of those functions is basically going to be mapped to a source that's going to have some hidden accuracy. Of course, you can make this more complicated, but let's just start there for now. And the idea is that there's some hidden ac there's some hidden true value. Let's do the binary case for now because it's easier to talk about. Hidden true value, yes or no. It's a classification, yes or no. And so the question is, how do you learn the parameters of this model, the accuracies of those individual sources and their correlations without ever seeing why? Now, if you remember your graphical models course, maybe it was at toward the end of the class, they talked a little bit about latent graphical models. And this is a latent model where we don't observe why. That's what's going on. So how could you possibly learn this? The intuition is that you're going to see these sources vote many, many, many times. So on every sentence, on every data item, you're going to see what Lambda 1 says on the first X1 and X2 and X3. And you'll get to see how often these sources agree with each other and disagree with one another. And that turns out to be enough signal in many cases to provably learn the underlying accuracies and structures. But that's the math that we have to do. That's our goal. Okay, but intuitively, you know, if one of those sources was perfectly accurate, and you would know how accurate the second source was by you know, how often it agreed with that first vote. That's the kind of reasoning that we're going to be able to exploit without having to know that one of the, the ground truth uh, things was perfectly accurate. That's all that's going on. So to give you a little bit of mathematics, the expected value of y times lambda i is basically going to be proportional to the, the accuracy of the source i. And what, what we the way we think about this or visualize it is that we're trying to compute a covariance. Okay? Now, we'd love those red squares. Those would basically tell us the accuracy of the sources. And in our toy example, we would be done. We'd be very happy about that. But we can't observe directly the correlation between y and the source because we don't know why. We don't know the truth. But what we do get to observe are the interactions of all the lambda i's with one another. And so what I've highlighted here is sigma sub o is the observed portion of the covariance matrix that we actually see. 
The green pieces we can see. In the binary case, we know that y with itself, if it's plus or minus 1, is always 1. So that green is fine. But we have to discover the red portions from the agreements and the disagreements. So this is formalizing that. How does it work? We're going to use the graph sparsity, which will come up in a second. Intuitively, it turns out that you can write the inverse of this matrix on the observed entries. And the reason that this matters, by the way, is that the inverse of the covariance, if you remember your graphical models, has zeros where, there's, where, we're, where we have independence in the original uh, graphical model. So if there's no edge, there's a zero in the matrix. Okay? Now, that means there's fewer degrees of freedom here. So we can't learn if absolutely everything is correlated with everything else. But if there's some amount of independencies and we got down to the minimal ones that you can get, we can estimate the accuracy. So imagine we know that structure for now just because it'll make the reasoning a little bit earlier, but we can learn that too. Okay. So we know that there are these zeros in the inverse. So we want to understand how we take advantage of those. Just wait one slide and we'll see how we do it. So it turns out that we can write this in, ter in terms of two things. One is what we observe. This is just the matrix inversion lemma plus some low rank function. And these ZIs basically have the characteristic just as intuition. If they're one, if their expected value is one, then that source is perfectly accurate. And if they're zero, they're normalized such that that's completely random noise. Okay, So we have to solve for these Zs. Now, the point is, is anytime we don't have an edge, we know that it's zero on the left-hand side. And so we've basically got an equation in terms of something we observe in green and some low rank parameter. And now it's just a game of making sure we have enough observations to def uniquely define those low rank parameters. Now, if you're a, a real stats nerd, sigma is full rank, so it's not really matrix completion, but it's of the form i plus some uh, rank one term. So it's intuitively close. Uh, so we should be able to do this is what I'm saying. Now, a couple of technical comments here. The first thing is that z and minus z are solutions, you'll notice. They only appear through a quadratic. That's our, our power two uh, relationship. That's a fundamental symmetry of the problem. If everyone was you know, correlated with the truth, we couldn't distinguish that from everyone being co correlated with exactly the opposite of the truth. So we have to make some assumption here, like your labeling functions are not adversarial. Weekly, like on average, they're more correlated with the right answer than not. Not that any individual one is, some of them can be quite bad, but at least on average, they're more correlated with the right answer than not. That's what, how we have to break this symmetry. When zi equals zero, notice that we get no information from the constraint. It zeroes off. So if zi is zero, then this constraint has, uh, you know, is just is basically zero at this point. And it's total noise. Now, as a statistician, when you see something as total noise, what it means is, as you get closer and closer to that, what you're going to worry about is how close can you get to total noise and still learn. And it turns out that there's this wonderful notion called effective rank from Vershinin that tells us how close we can get. It has to, they, Vershinin has to do with a continuous notion of rank, but basically the closer we get down so that it's still full rank and we can learn, um, this is the right measure, okay? And it scales inversely to the distance to zero, which is kind of what you would expect. And you know, without boring you, it's, it's actually the information theoretically optimal result, okay? So just to give you a sense, it's not gonna be a math talk. I indulge you myself for a little bit with a little bit of math, but we can learn the accuracy without any labels, which is really exciting, up to the information theoretic limits. We can even learn the correlations between the annotators and under mild assumptions, learn the entire structure, um, which is fantastic. We can optimally use, if you give me a tiny amount of label data, I can optimally use it to solve a debiasing problem that comes up from graphical models. And if you're a classical nerd, basically this this technique of using an effective rank, it turned out to be really profitable. I wish we had known it when we started the project. It allowed us to improve even the supervised rates, which was super cool. And Fred Saul, who's now a professor at Wisconsin, and Mei Chen did a bunch of this work. Mei is a, still a grad student at Stanford, and, and Fred is a professor at Wisconsin. Cool. All right. So after hearing all that, you probably think, like, well, that's kooky. This guy's talking about graphical models and matrix inversion lemma. Like, there's no way anyone uses this stuff. And I think that'd be a safe bet, usually. Um, but somehow this stuff got used, which was really exciting. And we were really fortunate here that the Google folks in particular who were sponsoring a lot of this work started to use it first in ads in a system they called Snorkel Drybell, which is still in production. And YouTube uh, started to use it. Um, and one of the great lessons from YouTube was it took them seven or eight months to be able to write their specifications for certain tasks. And they could kind of put the, those tools in the hands of the, the people who were building the models. And so they were the first ones that got into that iterative loop, which was super, super exciting. 
I should say it's also used at hundreds of enterprises and uh, now as well. And I want to make one comment about the company because people get confused about what the company does. It's much bigger than this programmatic supervision. We, we zoomed in on this and it's a huge enabler because it's the thing that allows you to take all that information that you have um, that's present in your system and combine it in interesting ways. The time to value thing that we saw in the research projects, that's true. It's all about time to value. But this idea is dramatically bigger. It's about how you manage and build AI applications. And you can apply the same ideas of how you model the sources to almost everything that's in the AI and machine learning pipeline. I have very you know, little influence over what the company does these days. Alex and team are really the ones running the show. But it's, it's wild to watch people in industry finally kind of get that view and say how it's taking things that would take them months down to days. Um, and that's been the thing that's been really exciting. I should also say that you know data-centric AI is way bigger. Uh, we were we feel like we were the first platform kind of in the area, but there's tons of stuff, and so we started kind of collecting that information. Karan, my student, put up a, a you know a page where people can contribute, and tons of people have contributed to it. We're really excited, and if I can get my act together, I'll teach a course next uh, year just to try and get you know some of the people and, and latest results into the pipe. Okay, okay. so now the second thing I wanted to talk about. So that was data-centric AI. The other trend is this foundation model. And I have to tell you why I love these things. Um, as I said, it's weird. I don't know. I sometimes feel uncomfortable how much I like them. So <clears throat> I was working on this problem, named entity disambiguation. Here's how it works. You, someone says to you, how tall is Lincoln? And you have to figure out, you know, is it the car? Is it the town in Nebraska? Or is it the, you know, president, right? And it turns out, how tall is Lincoln? Well, it's talking about a person. So in this case, it's the president right, in the US. Now, there's variations, right? How tall is Lincoln? You think maybe is Lincoln, the cheapest Lincoln. Well, that's a type of car. So you know, probably it's the car company. How many people are in Lincoln? Well, if you're in the US, it's the Lincoln, Nebraska. So the point is, is these are these subtle clues. These are these death by a thousand cuts problem. None of these look too hard if you kind of have a little bit of background knowledge. But if you have to answer billions of them, all of a sudden it gets a little tricky. So we were building a model in late 2017 with Fung, and we were really excited, and it was used in production, all the, all the rest. We built it by hand together, and it was this high-quality solution, um, you know, deep learning model, kind of blah, 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 doesn't matter. Now, maintenance was an issue because, as I mentioned, little small things would change in the pipeline, and then they would break. And so we were spending a lot of our time playing whack-a-mole, trying to fix what, you know, people had broken on different teams because they had slightly different assumptions. We showed it to our Apple overlords. They were very happy. We were we had just gotten it acquired. You always want to do something useful you know, after your acquisition. So we were really happy that, yeah, um, it was great, you know, awesome work. Uh, can you now roll it out to, I think, you know, I can't get the numbers, but it was tens of locales or languages around the world. And we didn't have people who spoke those languages. Uh, and they weren't going to give them to us. We said no new headcount, really, uh, for these things. So, oh my God, what are we going to do? So we started thinking. And we started reading. And around that time, by the way, Elmo came out. Elmo was the first paper that started this whole thing. Bert and all the rest. Elmo was the first. You know, uh, the team at uh, Washington and, and Allen AI just did an amazing job. And I found this paper just incredibly inspiring. They were talking about learning these deep contextual embeddings nearly automatically. Snorkel was also getting much attraction at ads. So we knew that technique was kind of working there. So we thought what we'll do is we'll kind of build a system out of these two ideas. And you know, it may be a little bit worse because we're kind of loosely and weekly training it for all these different languages that we don't even speak. But at least we can fulfill our mandate of trying to ship this NER product um, you know, to all these different languages. We got humbled. So we train these models um, nearly from you know, automatically and from scratch with weak supervision and self-supervision. And it stomped our hand-tuned model that we had been so proud of in English. And it was great in the other languages and it actually got shipped. And it was, it actually trains itself and every week and then was pushing itself to production, which was mind blowing to me. Um, we had great quality bumps and it really didn't change very much. You just fed in new data. We modeled the data sources that went in for quality and then off to the races it went. And it was, it was robust in a way that I, you know, had not seen AI software be. Um, this made me absolutely unsufferable. I was already pretty bad, but at this point, I just lost my mind because I, I went back to my lab and I was telling them, I was still mostly at my lab at that time. I was like, look, these things are amazing. I can't tell you exactly what we're doing, but oh my gosh, like, you know, these techniques are going to change everything we're doing. And I think they kind of, you know, 
ignored me and they were right to do that. But it was, it was wild to me. I just want to share with you like how shocking it was to me that like these problems that I thought could kind of never be solved that we were building in systems, like we saw a ray of light. I wouldn't say they're solved, but they're pretty interesting. These folks actually believed, most of them are students, some of them were, were at Apple. Um, very exciting. We, we documented this in a system called Bootleg if you want to check it out. Okay, now these two, uh, Ivanka is my incoming PhD student who was also an undergrad at Stanford. She did a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about in this next section. And Inez was my former uh, student um, who we still work together on a bunch of stuff. Okay, so I wanted to apply these foundation models to like more of like how the data gets built, the plumbing. You can see it in my, my heart of hearts, I'm a, I'm a data plumber. So let me tell you a little bit about what these foundation models are. And with Percy and Tatsu, we co-taught this course um, 324 to try and put down, it's all open source, you can look at it, just the basics of how these models work. And we're going to try and refine it over time. Super exciting project to be a part of. Taught it this last winter. So it's a simple old idea. This is a really old idea, autoregressive language modeling. You see the sentence, the mouse ate the blank, and you have to fill it in. And then you have probabilities that you learn from the corpus. Okay. Uh, the mouse ate the cheese is higher than the mouse ate the mouse is higher than the mouse ate the eight, for example. It doesn't kind of make sense. And then the idea is that, you know, if you do this, you can kind of build a model to estimate that probability. So the idea is that the neural net is going to compactly learn a representation for P. This allows us to generate answers, because if I look at the mouse ate the blank, I can just pick the one that the model thinks over the entire vocabulary has the highest probability. And to me, kind of most interestingly, it turns every sentence into a training example. I just take a word, I blank it out, I try to pr predict it, and now I can optimize over, which is called mass language model training. I can now do that over all of what I've seen. Okay. You can also do it causally. There's a bunch of tricks you can do here, but this allows you to basically create huge amounts of weekly supervised training data for these systems, which is exciting. Okay. All right. So, okay. You know, at this point, it's pretty exciting because we can train these models and we were using them. But the thing that made them really bizarre to me is this emergent behavior um, that we can generalize to new tasks with no fine tuning. Okay. This is literally something you can type in. So you type in something like a description, get the capital from the country, you give it a couple of examples France, Paris, Germany, Berlin, so on. Then you ask it, what's the capital of Canada? And GPT runs and it gives you the answer. That's wild to me. It was not trained to do this. You literally just gave it that text and asked it for the highest probability completion. Now, conditional probability is a messed up thing. In the US, there was this result that I think it's like your zip code, age, and uh, something else uniquely determines 85% of people. So conditional probability is weird. This is Latanya Sweeney's result, is what I'm referring to. But this thing seems to have some capabilities like this. And it's not just that. You can do translation, even though it wasn't really trained to do translation does actually gets pretty reasonable blue scores. And it can answer trivia questions. And it actually, as you see here, with what we call one shot, which is just giving it one example, it's already at the fine tuned soda. And you didn't have to retrain it. Wow. And then I can do some arithmetic. Not, not a lot of arithmetic, but some. Right. So it's not perfect. In fact, I'll talk about how it's kind of a dumpster fire in some ways. But it's amazing to me. Absolutely amazing to me. It blew my mind when I saw these things. So as I mentioned, these things all started with Elmo in about 2018. And in you know four shortish years, they're just phenomenal. I mean, there's just so much investment. So this has been really exciting. About two years ago, they started to really get amazing. I think to most people because they could do this emergent behavior. But you know, we've been, we were playing with these things kind of as they go. So it's not just text for this audience. One of the things that's crazy to me is that you can do it code. So you give it a, a comment that says, "Given a list of you know link persons, remove the duplicates, and return the results sorted by age." And it returns code to you. And this is what Copilot and Codex are. And you know, my lab, someone told me that the people who use it in our lab, it writes like 20, 25% of our code. Maybe we're writing too much boring code, but that's a lot of code. And one of the faculty I talked to who uses this every day, who's not a computer scientist, he told me it makes him two to three X more productive using these things. So those are really weak anecdotes, but still, I couldn't imagine doing something like this five years ago. It's unbelievable to me. Then this stuff I just like to play with, Describe an image in natural language, an astronaut playing basketball with cats in space and a children's book illustration. I mean, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. I don't, I don't know what it does, but I enjoy playing with it. Okay. So 
What about those death by a thousand cuts problems? Now you may wonder what's the connection to Taylor Swift. Well, she was the only non-grim hit for death by a thousand cuts that I found when I was looking for images. So, you know, it's more pleasant than what I could have put on this picture, but you know, couldn't foundation models be useful for these, right? So here's how data cleaning works. If you're not familiar, there's typos, there's conflicting values, there's outliers, there's all kinds of stuff. And it has this death by a thousand cuts type of feel. So we have handcrafted rules. We took external knowledge sources. And in 2017 with Ehab, uh, Shu, and, and Theo, we built this system uh, called HoloClean to do this. And it set new state of the art by a lot. Uh, it was really important to us in a lot of ways. And it was acquired by Apple in 2020. So what could foundation models do? This is Ivanica's thing. So what ended up happening is we looked at this thing, like, is there an error in a country? And we ran GPT-3. So here's on entity matching and imputation. So zero shot works on this, you know, it doesn't return garbage, but it's nowhere close to the soda. But what if we add in a couple of uh, examples? And here I think we added in uh, 10 examples uh, in some and three examples in the others. Oh my God, it's soda. That's frightening. And we're, we put up the kind of foundation models help wrangle data that'll be posted on archive this week. Send me an email, I can send you the preprint. We're making sure we get comments from everybody in. It's, it's spectacular to me. And the point is, is this was trained only to predict words. It was not trained to solve these entity matching imputation error detection challenges. That's insane to me, that's, that's wild. But it can be brittle. So even small changes in formatting, right? Missing these commas and, and question marks, all of a sudden it's broken. We don't know why or when that happens. So it's not like it's reliable and ready for prime time yet, just to share it with you in, in some ways. Those which K examples do you select? Avonica is great. If you can get access to her, just have her generate your examples. If you can't, then your quality goes down. And we did some random and some other baselines and we're sorting that out. Okay. And there's a pretty big gap in those demonstrations. And we we don't know why, honestly, yet. Like we don't have a theory yet. We're, we're working on it. I also say that the data curation matters this is a great paper that from Ludwig's team at Washington. Uh, where they show basically that data curation is responsible for all the robustness of these models in a very, and he kind of rules it out. So a very nice paper just got posted to archive. We just had a paper accepted last night um, that, you know, uh, me and Dan wrote about how you fuse models and weak supervision and can make them both better and, and where the data curation is. So the data still matters. These two trends actually play to each other. They're not running long enough that I can explain to you crisply, like how you fully integrate them. Because um, I don't know, but that's what we're working on. The other thing I'll say, which is really exciting, is uh, there's this challenge of long context. So the problem when the code goes poorly is it does kind of small snippets, but it can't, the way transformers work, they can only take in like 2,000 or 4,000 uh, tokens. They can't take in a million tokens. And so you want to be able to get longer and longer and longer context. And so this is something that people notice. They have the long range arena benchmark from Google. There was a great paper from Google about memorizing transformers last year, where they tried to do some tricks to get the transformers to memorize longer. Transformers are the building blocks here. And we just had this paper that was, you know, won a nice award at, at the past, this current iClear uh, for S4, which showed that you could get huge, huge models uh, trained efficiently. And Monarch, uh, which was an ICML as well, this just accepted this, this over the weekend. But they're all about how do we get long range dependencies in. And we don't know as a field, we're, we're still doing that. So if you imagine things where the context is relatively short, they work well for long things like reading an entire code base, we're just, we're just not there yet. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm close to time. So I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Is super, the thing that I wanna get across here is that these, um, these, these differences here that were in deep learning models scared the crap out of me. That's really what I care about getting across to you. There were two to three points, were they meaningful? And so the reason to believe they may not be meaningful. People did things like try to classify gender from uh, iris, and it turned out that they were picking up the mascara in the background. And the reason we want models is because they pick up signals that are too difficult for us to specify, but sometimes they pick up the wrong ones. Okay. So with this crew of folks, we looked and showed that, yep, in fact, this happens in medical applications. So this was another result. What you're seeing here is that a deep learning model is pay attention to the lesion on the left-hand side here. And then here are these two purple dots. That's what the model is paying attention to in the grad cam. You see that the red images in the bottom mask show that it's only paying attention to those two things. Well, those indicate you're going for surgery. Collapsed lungs, here are two pictures of collapsed lungs. There was this great result, oh, we're better than radiologists in, in AI. 
It had an AUC of 0.87. People wrote lots of stories about it. Well, it turns out that a third of the images actually contained a chest strain in them. And if you remove the chest strain, which means you're already treated, the performance goes, as Ben Rack said, from superhuman to worse than a first year resident. Okay. So this is something we call hidden stratification. I won't bore you with the details. The point that's really critical for this audience is you would never write a feature that says, if there's a drain, then say someone has pneumonia. If there's a purple dot, then they have cancer. You just wouldn't write those down. But because the abstraction is so much higher, the machine is perfectly happy to do that because it's a, it's a reliable indicator. If you see the purple dot, that person someone has judged has cancer. You should trust the purple dot. So how do you deal with those kind of errors in the abstraction? And so we started trying to formalize these kind of what we call hidden stratifications, where the data is split in this way. And as I thought this would never be solved, I'll just highlight quickly here that folks made some progress on this. Um, and we, we had some interesting progress in, in NeurIPS 2020 uh, on it. Um, and just recently in ICML, we just have another paper that nearly closes the gap from these distributionally robust systems that they allow you to just train and find these subsets on a lot of the benchmarks. I don't want to give you the message that this problem is solved. It is not. I want to give you the message that we, one, these deep learning systems actually in their embeddings have more information than they're letting on. They're predicting incorrectly, but they actually are learning something that's valuable. And these methods suggest we can coax it out sometimes, which suggests some optimism. So those deep learning methods doing a little bit better actually are doing better for hopefully a good reason. That's something that's exciting to me. And I should point out that this is based on a lot of great works with Tatsu, John, Chelsea, Percy, and many other of my colleagues who, who work on robustness. Okay. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say a couple things here that you know these waves are building. I wanted to share with you my weird biases, why I care about this stuff and what I'm doing uh, so that you can appropriately discount it. Data-centric AI is still in its first innings in industry, but it's a massive opportunity. You're seeing the fact that people can program the data being an entirely new way to build applications. And I think more folks, you know, getting involved there over the last couple of years has made it a rich and extraordinarily interesting area. I learn a ton. We continue to work on it. Foundation models aren't even out of the gate. We don't even really know how to use them yet, but they give us new attacks on classical problems. I shared some of those classical problems with you, um, and you know, hopefully you, you got something interesting from that. Um, but it's very, very early. And the fundamental challenges here are in robustness and building applications. These are things that really are, are taking the center of gravity, in, in my view, away a little bit from the AI folks and moving them more to the systems, the software engineering, and the other folks. How are we going to use these things? Right? We've shown some impressive proofs of concept, but how are they going to make a real impact? So with that, thank you so much for your time and attention. And sorry, I ran a couple minutes over. Thank you so much, Chris, for the amazing talk. Um, we have time for questions. So if you have any questions for Chris, um, feel free to unmute yourself and show your video, or you can also type questions in the chat and I can ask on on your behalf. And so so actually, I really liked what, you, what you're showing with like the foundational models, because we've been looking actually at Copilot recently and it's just fascinating, fascinating to see how much, how many different applications we have for tools like Copilot, based on just one single model, and how how, how important also the context is. And actually, Andre has his, Andre I think had a question, or not? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi, Christopher. Thank you for for the amazing talk. I wanted to uh, to, to ask you about the foundation model. Um, so let's consider DALI as a, one of the success stories in the field, right? So people pull the uh, random phrases like you did about the uh, astronaut on the horse, and uh, it uh, generates an amazingly drawn image. And um, like I wanted to ask you, how much of a is that creativity? Do you think, does it, or, or do you think that's actually if you if you scale it, it will regress to the mean and. Uh, that's the whole story because it's just trained on the existing data. What's your take on this? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So I have a colleague, uh, Kayvon Fatahelian, who's a visual computing guy, and he is less impressed with Dolly than I am because I'm impressed. I just to, just so we understand our biases, I'm impressed that you type in, uh, you know, text and an image actually comes back. Just an image itself is amazing to me. The fact that it's even plausibly related to the text, I'm still awed by. But if his point is 
it's not close to what he would consider even, even a creative tool, let alone itself being creative, because it's very difficult still to refine these images and understand how to control the generation fully. And so this is, I'm not, it's not saying something that's not known to the field. It's that there's these, these models that are out there that people are working on now to try and make the generation more controllable as kind of some part of human in the loop so it's more like a dialogue. I think you're gonna see a wave of, of those things coming next. As to whether it's really creative, I mean, the cases in the images are so stunning to me that they're, it's difficult for me to know, you know, is it just interpolating the data? The cases that are a little bit more immediate to me of where it works and where it doesn't work are the cases in code and in the um, kind of the, the, the things I shared with you about data cleaning, data integration. These are things where the reasoning patterns are somewhat subtle and it manages to get them with a fairly high frequency, which is to me pretty shocking. On the other hand, in code, it fails reliably in places and people start to change the way they program to make the model work a little bit better. Like, you know, you know, autocomplete works, so you kind of start typing and hit tab. It's like that on steroids. And so the reason I'm saying this is there's this weird symbiotic thing with these images where it's like, you know how to coax out of it what you want. And it has like a, it's like a different tool. So I don't think about it as embodying creativity. It's like maybe it's reduced creativity to kind of the prompt and the way you interact with it and what you select. Um, but that's still, to me, kind of creative. So that the thing that's really fascinating is you watch when people play with these tools. And Thomas, you mentioned you're, you're playing with Copilot. It's wild to watch how it changes how people program, what they assume it does well, or in fact, that they view their job as reviewing the code that's written and changing it. Because it's always wrong in important ways, right? Like it, it generates a bunch of stuff, but it's kind of subtly off from what you would want. And Kayvon's complaint is in the images, you can't get it reliably to what you actually wanted or had in your head. So it's not a, it's not a creative tool. And the code, you can, right? You could, because you could have written the code yourself quite easily. So going through it is different. So it doesn't directly answer your question of whether it's creative, but it like samples from a space that's difficult for you to get access to. Yeah, so wonderful thought. I, I don't know, I guess is another way to think about it. Yeah, I see, probably not, not, neither of us does. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Ali. Maybe, maybe just a comment. Great talk, by the way. But I'm a user of Copilot. I'm really impressed, especially with the documentation it produces. So you like Linux is, and it tells you it's a Unix-like operating system based on Linux kernel. It has better language than I do. So <laughs> I, I, it's more eloquent than I am. Uh, I have a few issues. Uh, so the code it generates is based on already written code in GitHub. So it right. might generate some licensing issues. That's why I'm wary of using that. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how that could be remedied in the future, like being able to use those automated models without worrying about other legal aspects. Yeah, the legal aspects are fascinating. So yeah, so I've observed the same things as well. I think the, the legal aspects are interesting. So one of the reasons we formed this Center for Foundation Models is we wanted to get people involved who could answer those questions and understand, you know, in the US what the copyright law says, internationally, what are the right norms for this? There's kind of the things that we all observe are kind of unfair, that it's in some ways, you know, like we read a lot of code and then we go write the code, right? And so if we read a lot of code that's public, you know, available, somehow we can move it over and not have a problem. Why is it, why are we uncomfortable when the machine does it? And so we have to understand what are the legal frameworks around that. But we started to get lawyers in the room and other folks who think about this to try and get at those issues crisply. And there's a bunch of workshops on it at Stanford that are you know, public and I think virtual, uh, so folks can attend and, and poke and ask questions. And so I've been deferring to that. I also have a student who's a joint JD, uh, is doing their law degree and a PhD simultaneously. So I mainly turn to him and ask questions about, you know, how is this gonna evolve? I think our current understanding is, that because of the way the copyright laws are in the U.S., they're on more they're on more safe ground than you than you may think. Because as I said, I can read code and then go read something. The directly reproducing passages and plagiarizing them that's a that's a real serious challenge. Um, but I don't you know as I said I don't know I, I wouldn't want to speak for folks about how they're thinking about getting around that. It would be nice if people could actually contribute their data to these models and build them as really community resources. That's how we did it in Wikipedia. That's how we did it in all these other, you know, kind of communities that I've tangentially been a part of. The question to me is how do you tie incentives together so that someone who contributes their code or contributes a little bit of compute or does something like that is actually fairly compensated for it? 
and and I have some thought. I'm writing a white paper about that. And so I'd love if you're interested, send me a note. I can send it to you and, and kind of codify them. There doesn't seem to be a simple answer, but you don't want to have a situation where these models basically disincentivize creators from writing that new code that's so valuable or those new images that's so valuable because they just get kind of scooped up and the system makes money, but not the people who are actually doing the creative and interesting work. And so trying to understand those principles is something that's very, very much on my mind. Um, and I'm trying to lean on people who are much smarter than me and more knowledgeable than me to do this. But I, I agree with you. And, and the comments are wild, right? Like every once in a while, comment code, and you're like, man, I wouldn't have thought to that. Like, I'm so embarrassed about what I would have left there. Um, but yeah, great, great point. Thank you. Yeah. And you can you can lose yourself hours and they're trying to see what's going to figure. I asked it to solve the traveling salesperson problem, the MP hard <laughs> one, and just.